the entire space of how chips are being manufactured is changing right now. You see a few things. You see Intel is starting to manufacture chips to other companies. That's a new move by Intel. Until now, they manufactured chips in their own fabs just for themselves. And now the Intel's CEO announced that they're going to manufacture to Microsoft uh, chips uh, worth uh, $15 billion, I think. So it's a big move, right, from Intel side. Welcome to The Future Of, a podcast by Fresh Consulting, where we discuss and learn about the future of different industries, markets, and technology verticals. Together, we'll chat with leaders and experts in the field and discuss how we can shape the future human experience. I'm your host, Jeff Dance. In this episode of The Future Of, uh, we're talking about the future of AI chips which have become quite a hot commodity uh, recently. With me is Dr. Ronan Dar, co-founder and CTO of RunAI, a NVIDIA preferred partner that optimizes and orchestrates GPU compute resources for AI and also deep learning workloads. Uh, RunAI has been uh, recognized by Wired, uh, Forrester and Gartner, and in 2022 actually raised $75 million of funding. Their platform uh, offers GPU optimization, cluster management, and uh, AI ML workflow management. So Dr. Ronan is really familiar with the topic. We're grateful to have him on the show. He comes with uh, uh, a relevant uh, undergrad, master's, and PhD. Um, So really has the depth of expertise to help us understand what's going on in this hot space. Uh, Grateful to have you with us, Ronan. Yeah. Hey, Jeff. Good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. And it's a, a, AI and chips for AI are an amazing, uh, amazing topic uh, with a lot of importance, a lot of things are happening in that space. So happy to, to be here and speak about it. Thank you. Tell us a bit more about your journey. How did you, how did you kind of come to be so focused on this area? Help the audience understand uh, as, as we think about the future of AI chips, uh, how you fit in. Yeah, so, um, so obviously um, since we started Run AI, in 2018, I'm focused on AI, on running AI workloads um, uh, and on GPUs. And so we're in that space for the last six um, years and we saw the space going. We, see, we saw the innovation happening in the space, everything that, you know, happening with the demand for GPUs um, and other AI chips. And that, that, that's amazing. And before Run AI, I'm actually I'm coming with a background that um, it mixes both academia and industry. So I've been for many years in the, uh, in the academia. I did my master's and my bachelor's, my master's, my PhD, and my postdoc, yeah, all in electrical engineering. And, and in part, of it, I also worked in the industry and in a few uh, chip companies. So I was for Intel. I was for a startup here in Israel. We built a, a chip that, uh, that uh, optimizes performance of flash storage and that startup was bought by Ethel. At one time Ethel, so Ethel came into Israel and, and started an R&D center around chip design and, uh, and a lot of Apple's you know, hardware is being designed here in Israel based on that uh, acquisition. So I got familiar with, the, with how chips are being designed and, uh, and you know, what it takes and what it takes to, to, to have an R&D around that. And, and in the 2018, yeah, I started uh, running AI together with my co-founder Omri. So Omri is, is the CEO and he's an amazing person. I, we met in the academia. He also did his master's, worked a lot back then. And, and we saw back then in 2018, uh, two very important things. The one that AI is going to change the world, right? There is an amazing new, new technology that is going to be transformative. Yeah, I believe that it's uh, the, the most transformative technology that uh, the humankind ever created. And so that w- that's one. And we also saw that GPUs and chips and actually compute power is going to be critical for AI. And, and people will need more and more and more compute power to build better and better AI. And we, we, we went and um, we went and started around AI around that, around um, um, building solutions for GPUs for AI workloads. Yeah, we saw that there is a, a gap in terms of what's needed for AI and GPUs and what's out there. And then we went and started Run AI. And, and yeah, and, and a lot of things have happened since then. And yeah, it's a, a good, good journey until now. 
Great journey. And it's amazing to think of uh, all the growth that's happened in the last year. But the fact that you had the depth of expertise, plus the foresight kind of five years prior to all this, you know, massive growth to to be in the space and be preparing for it is is quite an incredible, um, you know, uh, journey. So that's awesome. Uh, let's start with some of the basics. You know, we all know AI chips, specifically GPUs are kind of very high, right? Hot right now. Well, why is there such a demand? You know, I was just looking at NVIDIA now being um, uh, valued at the fourth largest company in the world. And they were kind of under the radar there for a little bit. They were smaller than Intel. Now Intel like they're, you know, is a small com- company compared to kind of their valuation. Um, so we've kind of seen this in the stock market. We're hearing about it. But why is there such a big demand for AI chips right now? Yeah, so amazing. And what happened with NVIDIA in the last year is absolutely amazing. Uh, specifically in the last year, but um, the the height and the growth of NVIDIA as a company and, and the demand for the product, the GPU, is just growing tremendously in the last decade, actually. Um, I think a few things happened. So let's speak maybe about, first of all, about what happened in 2023. So in 2023, the demand for GPU grew amazingly fast much faster than uh, than ever before. And it followed um, ChatGPT and OpenAI. That's right. So OpenAI introduced to the world ChatGPT in November 2022. And suddenly the entire world had access to the amazing capabilities of large language models, right? Like generative AI models. And my mother is using ChatGPT, right? Everyone had, had access. Everyone has access to that. So people saw what amazing capabilities Gen AI holds and how transformative it can be to industries and what impact it can have, can have. And that triggered a race of many companies to build generative AI applications, to train LLMs, to build applications and workloads on top of LLMs. So a lot of buzz and, and excitement around generative AI. Now, to build generative AI applications and to use large language models, you need compute power and you need a lot of compute power. You need GPUs. And, and with that rate came a huge demand for GPU power. And the demand got so high that it was much higher than what the supply chain of GPUs could supply. So last year, uh, the GPU shortage created, right? Was it? And people were, were looking for GPUs, for the new GPUs and couldn't find. It's still, the GPU shortage is still somewhat real. Still, if you could go, if you would go to AWS, for example, or one of the cloud providers and try to spin up the newest H100 GPU, you might wait four days until you get one, uh, uh, one GPU machine like that. So the, the shortage is still there. Um, I think it's, it's, the supply chain are much better now, right? NVIDIA had to increase the, the pace of uh, manufacturing those GPUs um, together with, you know, TSMC and then the, the, the chip manufacturers. And now this situation is much better, but NVIDIA grew uh, significantly. And we, everyone, uh, all of us uh, heard about the NVIDIA stock and how it did in the last uh, 18 months. And so that's what happened in the last year. I think the growth and the trends around GPUs exist already in the last 10 years, already since 2012, 2013, we've seen this trend of um, a bigger and bigger. Also, it, we also saw it in crypto somewhat, but in AI in specific, we saw this trend of bigger and bigger models, right? In AI, bigger is better. So in the last 10, day, 10 years, people have developed bigger and bigger models with more and more parameters. Uh, big models that are more capable, that are trained on more data, and that can do much better. To, and that, they can, that can get into much better accuracy to do much, you know, new stuff. And and with all of that came um, the need for more and more GPUs. Right? If you train bigger models on more data, you need more computing power. You're doing more processing. So in the last decade, we saw that this requirement in terms of computing power to train state of the art models go 100 million times. Right. So 100 million times, that's eight orders of magnitude increase in just the amount of compute power that you need to train state-of-the-art models. Right. So GPT-4 was trained uh, last year on 
10 and 100 million X more compute, compute than 10 years ago. So that's crazy. So the trends are there for the last uh, decade. More and more compute power, more and more GPUs are in it. G- the GPUs originally created for, you know, as, as graphical uh, processing units to kind of render graphics, but it just tur- turns out they're really good at parallel processing, right? And and for doing mathematical equations and for uh, for really data intensive applications. And so it was it kind of happenstance that, that that they became so, you know, needed and powerful? Like, um, was it sort of a, you know, an accident? Um, because they weren't originally created for what the what the AI has come to be. Is that is that the reality? Because you know, did Nvidia have this foresight, or they just like stumbled upon the idea, like oh oh, you know, these just so happen to be one of the the, the most important things for 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 uh, these LLMs. Yeah, it's an amazing question, Jeff. I think that you know the answers, but <laughs> Nvidia is an amazing company with a big vision, and they had that vision. Yeah, already uh, 20 years ago. So actually, NVIDIA is not a new company, right? NVIDIA exists for the last 30 years, right? 30 years, um, they, 30 years that they sell GPUs. Um, and the main application for GPUs um, 20 years ago was uh, gaming, right? Graphical uh, applications. So GPUs were really good in that. And, uh, and, and gaming is wonderful, but gaming is relatively a niche um, workload, right? A niche, a niche industry compared to all the cloud workloads out there, right? Um, but NVIDIA had this vision that, as you say, um, GPUs can accelerate not just graphical processing, just graphical workloads, but any workload with uh, linear algebra calculations, right? So they, their vision was that they could accelerate scientific computing. Um, so they created CUDA in, in uh, 2006, actually, um, to make it much easier for developers to accelerate their workloads with GPUs. Because before CUDA, you needed to be an expert to program a workload to run on a GPU. GPUs are really complex. So they created this software framework called CUDA to make it much, much easier for people to run workloads on GPUs. And that enabled several years afterwards um, the big breakthrough of AI, the big breakthrough of AI in the industry, or the big breakthrough of deep learning happened because of a few, a few things, but one of the most critical reasons is that GPUs were out there. The researchers from Toronto University, they were the first to show this big breakthrough that you can train deep learning models on GPUs. They use CUDA for that, and they were able to accelerate their workloads and all those of magnitudes, and um, and they could train bigger models, and they could achieve results that no one saw before. They just broke records, and then in, in 2012, that was the in the industry that was the big breakthrough of deep learning on GPUs. It was enabled by the not just memory now, not just CPU. GPU has sort of brought computing to a new level. Uh, there's talk about this GPU revolution. We've heard about Sam Altman, you know, uh, uh, wanting to work with countries to to uh, uh, raise $7 trillion with a T to help uh, build more AI chips uh, as we think about the, the future, just mind boggling. What, what are your thoughts on Sam's ask and getting involved at the country level? Like, is, is, this, re- is this realistic? Um, tell us more. Uh, okay, that's a big question, right, Jeff? Because yeah, Sam Altman, right, yeah, think about it. Sam Altman was the first to raise a $10 billion at or a startup, right? I don't think that any startup before raised such uh, amounts, right? And and they raised ten billion dollars, and because they needed a lot of GPUs, all of that money doesn't go to people, right? It goes, you know, just get computing power directly to Nvidia to buy GPUs, most of it, right? And 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 now that um, that's a problem because Nvidia, right, dominates the market, and and if I'm sure that the OpenAI people look forward. And they see the amount of GPUs and the amount of computing power that they will need to continue to grow as they are growing until now and to continue to innovate in AI and to continue to build bigger and bigger models and to host all, you know, the chat GPT and all of their applications. So they, they will need a lot of GPUs. And right now it's a place where, and, and 
it's a place where they have, I guess, you know, they're really dependent on NVIDIA and the supply chain of NVIDIA and, and the prices of NVIDIA and, and, and how fast NVIDIA and TSMC are manufacturing GPUs for them. So I, I, I guess, right. I'm, I'm just guessing. So my guess is that, um, it's around that. It's a very strategic move uh, around manufacturing new chips. I think, uh, and so Sam Altman is, is going around that. I think it's, it, there is even bigger story around geo, geopolitical issues and, um, and the entire space of, of how chips are being manufactured is changing right now. You see, you see, uh, you see a few things. You see Intel uh, starting to manufacture chips to other companies. That's a new move by Intel. Until now, they manufacture chips in their own fabs just for themselves. And now the Intel CEO announced that they're going to manufacture to Microsoft uh, chips uh, worth uh, $15 billion, I think. So it's a big move, right, from Intel side. So the entire manufacturing uh, space is changing also because the, the chip act by Biden and, you know, uh, the, the chip war that is happening between countries right now. So it's, it's a big, big, big story, I think, that it's... It's important, you know, at the country level. You know, as we think about AI chips, there's the, you know, there's the GPU, there's the the ASIC, the the, um, the integrated circuit, the FPGA, um, and then there's the CPU. Like, it, is there are there other aspects of AI chips that are that are really changing, or is it all is, is it all centering around sort of the GPU? Yeah. Okay. Good question. Um, so there there are the GPUs. Nvidia is the dominant player. Um, right. Intel and AMD also have their own GPUs, but there are, um, um, initiatives of other companies to, um, to offer new types of chips that are more specialized to uh, AI. Exactly. Yeah. So Google, for example, they are offering, um, their chip, which is called TPU, Tensor Processing Unit. So they offer it in their cloud, on Google Cloud. And it, it, it's built somewhat differently than GPU, and it's very oriented to deep learning world models, to language models. Um, Amazon have their own chips that they uh, manufacture, that they build and design, and also on their cloud. Intel has their own. So all the big companies are building their their, their own offering for AI chips. Most of the, the big companies, yeah. And there are also startups who also have like more innovative solutions around chips that can um, compete with the, the NVIDIA GPUs. It's interesting. It kind of reminds me of, you know, the platforms that we rely on to grow. You know, and we think about the, I don't know if you've read the platform revolution, but it talks about, the, you know, the railroad and how that was a platform and then on and on. And then how, you know, the cloud you know, that, you know, in the last 10 years has become like a platform and, you know, and, and it seems like now these AI chips are becoming like a platform and these companies are, seems to be taking matters into their own hands going like, I, I can't rely on the ecosystem. I need to build my own. I need to have some control. These big tech companies with the resources, but it seems like countries are doing the same thing going like, Hey, I need access. I need, I need to know that I can get these chips. And so I can see why you're saying sort of the, the ecosystem and the supply chain is really evolving and changing really quickly. We saw a lot of, a lot of problems in the pandemic that now have seen some resolution. For example, some of the supply chain problems. But, you know, when you have these big pains in, in, in the ecosystem, it, it creates a lot of innovation um, and a lot of change and a lot of investment as well. Um, we've seen a lot of, a lot of, uh, news articles around you know the billions of dollars that people are investing in, in chips. What other what other innovation are you seeing as an expert in the field? You know, as we think about the next ten to twenty years forward, and that's a long time. I know you, you've been in this in the space for a while, and we can all look at the Nvidia last ten to twenty years, kind of look at the stock price and see how quickly things can change. So, knowing that things can change, what are some of the things you know you're looking forward to in the future? Yeah, um, another big question, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but yeah, pulling the pulling the rounds, right? And um, so I think yeah, I can only guess, right? So I think first of all, uh, what people are underestimating when speaking about chips for AI is the power of um, of the of software, the software ecosystem. So people are speaking a lot these days about new chips that maybe can beat uh, the NVIDIA GPUs at uh, certain benchmarks, right, and, and, and attain better performance. 
NVIDIA is very dominant in the market today, very much because of the software ecosystem that they have started to build since 2006, right? When they started to build Coda. And so they built Coda and they build, they're building a lot of layers in, in the software stack. So right now it's really difficult for, uh, for new companies to get in because, you know, all the models are being trained today on, on GPUs, right? So uh, they, all the innovations are happening on GPUs. So, but that, that's one thing, but I, do think that we're going to see more a uh, new offering of chips, right? That will get some market share. I think around inference, it's really interesting. And um, inferencing is different than training. Right? So inference is the phase where you take a trained model and uh, you actually deploy it and you, 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 you give it like new data and the model is inferencing. It gives you results out of that new data, right? So with ChatGPT, for example, when we prompt it, that's inference, right? The, the trained model, it gives you results, right? And so inference is, uh, looks differently than training and the hardware requirements, I think, are different and, and you need different types of chips. So if I see an opportunity and now is, is, is around inference, yeah, in the next few years, inference is going to be big, a uh, big market, right? We'll see more and more AI running a production and more and more applications based on AI. And those applications will probably need um, need to run on accelerators, on hardware, right, on new chips. So, and then ZDS GPUs might not be the perfect match, right? Um, so I, I do think that inference might be an interesting use case. I think we're going to see in the next 10 to maybe 20 years, more and more chips that are specialized to specific workloads. And like we've seen now, right, chips that are specialized for AI. Much like the cloud, you know, the cloud is sort of, there's a lot of special, specialized clouds, the government cloud, for example, you know. Um, so a lot, a lot more specific kind of tuned hardware for those specific use cases. Yeah, yeah. So it, I think it, it will become economically viable to build chips specific for workloads that are big in the cloud, that they have a lot of, a lot of market, a lot of demand, right? And so economically wise, it might be relevant. So more specialized chips, I think uh, it, it, it makes sense. But you know, let's see, it's like so, so hard to predict what will happen, right? Yeah. A lot of changes in a year uh, in this space. You know, they say, I think, I think Bill, Bill Gates had said that, you know, uh, we, we overestimate what happens in a year, but we underestimate what happens in 10 years. But I think with, with AI, I think it's like we're, we're uh, overestimating um, what happens in a, uh, in a year, uh, like a year, but we're underestimating, I'm uh, sorry, we overestimate what can happen in like three months, but we're underestimating what can happen in a single year. You know, um, I think it's sort of come down on a, on an order of magnitude because uh, the pace of change is, is quite fast. And you had mentioned how your, your grandma is, is, uh, or your, your mother is using, um, you know, uh, chat GPT. And a lot of uh, people have said, you know, ChatGPT is actually on an order of magnitude better than a lot of other platforms. Um, I'm curious if you believe they're going to be able to keep their edge because there's there's the backend compute, there's also the inference. But it seems from an inference perspective, ChatGPT still has has an edge. Um, we work heavily with uh, you know uh, generative AI for robotics, and so we're seeing lots of interesting things uh, there, um, given how you know you have these these specialized models. And so I, I, I'm in agreement that. We're going to see a lot of specialization, you know, uh, as we go forward around different use cases, uh, different bodies of knowledge, um, different inference. But um, do you, do you think that ChatGPT will be able to remain its uh, remain, you know, a leader? Yeah, I think, um, I think OpenAI did now are doing an amazing job, right? They are keep innovating now. We saw what they did with uh, yeah. with Sora, right? With text to video. So those capabilities are, are out there. There are some companies doing, you know, similar stuff. But OpenAI, when they do it, it's like they do it much better than anyone else, right? Like Sora is, is I didn't use Sora actually, but from the results that I saw out there in the internet, it's like, it's amazing, amazing things, right? So it's not still now. OpenAI are doing an amazing job and they, they're creating a lot of uh, amazing stories that, uh, that you know, everyone will remember from, you know, from ChatGPT to Sora and to, you know, Sam Altman being fired and then coming back, right? So, and let's just say, like, amazing stories are happening around, around OpenAI. And, you know, at the end, and 
they are only 500 people company, right? That's crazy. That's crazy. It's like such a small company and they're doing more than, I think, more than uh, $2 billion right, in revenues in AR. And like, yeah, actually it's tough. And so, so uh, I, I believe in them. I think yeah, they, they, they have this big challenge of uh, right now AI is very costly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think they're working out to reduce the cost. Yeah. And, and that's also, I think, like an interesting trend of uh, inference. Uh, yeah. The cost of inference going down with uh, people are optimizing their models and, and making sure that they're running better and their GPUs become better. And so like the cost of inference goes down. So, and what the innovation is, is, is being driven by bigger models, right? So like innovation is driven by bigger models, more, more parameters and so on. But then inference cost goes down with more specialized yeah. models, smaller models. Um, so I think OpenAI are, are, are doing amazing jobs. And let's see what, how it will go with the, you know, with the $7 trillion investment, right? Maybe that will d decide their fate if they become, you know, retain their leadership. It's clear they have a lot of leadership, a lot of clout. And, and sometimes that works out for companies. You know, um, you look at the Apple with the iPhone, you know, uh, and how they you know, evolved into being predominantly a, a smartphone company, you know, uh, with where their revenue is. And Tesla is similar. And, you know, it's like, will, will OpenAI be the first that re remains the first or will they be the first that paves the way where someone else kind of leapfrogs? Because sometimes it's right. the second that kind of picks up. Exactly. What, what uh, do you think, Jeff? What's your opinion on that? I, I think I think if the capital flows, um, then I, then I think so. I think that they I think that there's an element of them having the capital, but also I think that this their size may be part of their competitive advantage as well, where they're like they're operating kind of like a a crazy funded startup that has has the true innovators, you know, on the edge. So um, I I definitely um, after you know talking to others that are talking about some of the differences between models, they, they definitely have uh, an edge. And I think it's possible to sustain as long as the capital keeps flowing. So uh, I'm, I'm, that's, that's my hunch. Um, it's easy to say right now, but that, that's my hunch as well. Um, tell me more about um, you know, ethics. As you think about ethics, and another big question, but as we think about these AI resources and chips, um, the, you know, the environmental impact is huge. Um, well, you know, what else do we need to consider from an ethical perspective? Um, their AI has a you know big range of ethics. There's there's people that are for it. There's people that are against it. Um, and there will always be as we have change with people, there will always be people that are for and against things. Um, but any thoughts around the eth ethical things that we should be considering? I think it's a hard hard topic, a very important one. And I think we as humanity have experienced how it looks when technology goes bad with social network, right? And in my opinion, at least, right, social networks brought a lot of good things, but also, and that has also a lot of harm. And, and so I think we, um, we saw that and people have concerns around AI. And I also have concerns around AI. It's such a powerful technology. I think it's the most I said before, the most transformative technology that humankind will uh, ever uh, built, right, created, that going to change everything. And, and you know, I think it, um, it's, it's on this, it's tech industry on, on the people who are actually building that technology, who are actually building applications on top of that technology to make sure that um, it's, the technology is bringing mainly good to humanity. Um, you know, I, I like what Google did. Google, they, I think most of Google's products brought a lot of good, more, much more good than, than ARM. So I think it's a, at the end, it's a, on the community itself, on the industry itself to put the right DNA, to put the right, the right guard there is, the right uh, a mindset and make sure that this technology is going to bring uh, mm -hmm. good things and, and minimize the bad things. Yeah. Yeah. I think with any, any technology, there can be a, a a lot of good. There can be a dark side to it as well. Um, almost with with all tech, we have that. But I think as we look at some of these transformative things, you know, technology moves so fast; it has a life of its own. Sometimes, sometimes we wake up and we don't realize what we've created, you know, mm. and or how 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 much change we have have caused. And and humans, you know, don't adapt as fast as 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 technology does. So I think the foresight of 
experts like you and and uh, those that are in the space are important that we haven't that we we consider the intent of what we're doing and, and we have you know, we consider humanity at the same time so it's good to hear your perspective on that three more questions as we kind of wrap up um, one is are any other advancements in AI that you're personally excited about that you that you haven't shared so far thanks to video right that's the new stuff by open AI okay that's and that's amazing and there are so many things that we're going to see with AI, so many things that I'm actually excited about. And I, I think, you know, everything that we do with data is going to change, you know, how we search things in data, how we get insights into data. It all can move into natural language. I think um, avatars, right? Just like digital images of us in the internet, we, I'm seeing, you know, startups doing those things and it actually works really, really good, right? So, and yeah. There are a few startups working on that. Um, you mentioned robotics, right? Robotics might be, might be more down there in the future, but also really exciting. So a lot of things are going to happen in the next years, right? Yeah, it's, it seems to be like one of the great accelerators. In our, with our robotics team, we've been able to make some, some great leaps forward as we think about the usability between humans and machines and then the translation between uh, things that you need and things that a robot does. and and the ability for the, you know, the robot to see uh, leveraging often, you know, these large language models, right? So, uh, and that's helped us accelerate uh, quite a bit. Um, what, you know, as you think about your, you're a leader in the space, your, your, your partner with NVIDIA as well, who's, you know, the dominant GPU leader in the space. Um, who do you look for, for insights? You know, as we think about the future, are there, can you name any uh, leaders or books or, you know, resources that listeners might be interested in? Yeah, there are a few. First of all, I love to hear, to listen to Tan Altman speaking. Tan Altman and uh, Ilya Stokovic. Ilya Stokovic is the, the chief scientist of OpenAI. So more on the technology, I love to hear and listen to him. Um, so for sure, Sam Altman and, and Ilya Stokovic. Um, on the infrastructure side, in Jensen, Jensen from NVIDIA, the NVIDIA CEO, he's amazing. He has big vision. I always listen to his keynotes. So actually, at NVIDIA's conference, GTC, is happening in March and yeah. towards the end of March. That's their biggest com uh, conference. And there is so much excitement around that conference. We, Run AI, going to be in that conference. We're going to be Diamond Sponsors. Going to have a big booth with a lot of people. I'm going to give a, a couple of talks there, and and uh, and Jensen is going to give a, a keynote. So Jensen's keynotes are amazing. So I encourage people to listen to Jensen keynote two hours, and a lot of great stuff uh, are coming there. Where is it going to be at? It's in uh, San Jose live. Yeah, I, they, they it wasn't live since 2019, I think, since COVID hit. Um, but there were like virtual keynotes of Jensen. They are always, always uh, the keynotes are, these keynotes are amazing. Good stuff. Um, anything else on the future that you think would be beneficial for our listeners? Uh, it's going to be critical and strategic to, to, to companies and to countries, as you say. It's just going to grow. We're going to see more and more and more compute, uh, compute out there. We're going to see more and more data centers out there. So this footprint of what we're doing with compute is just going to increase in the in the next 10 years for sure 20 years so uh, compute is, is really important yeah tell me more about what you're going to be talking about at the nvidia conference what is kind of what are some of the core topics that you're going to be covering so i'm going to speak about to run ai about challenges with gpus on how to manage and orchestrate gpus how to give your data scientists and ai engineers the best tools out there to uh, to do their work the fastest that yeah, they, they can do, how to get the most out of your GPUs and so on. That's one talk. Uh, the second talk is a talk about a benchmark. It's more deep dive, more technical to developers. It's, it was expect, expected to GTC, so it's not sponsored. I'm not going to speak uh, 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 almost any about run AI. So it's going to be on LLM training, on how to train a big, large language models right um, on GPUs. Uh, we did some benchmarking. We, I'm going to speak about best practices in that sense. So really, like deep dive into the the the, the, tech, the you know the the how to train uh, LLMs on GPUs. 
Uh, Dr. Ronan, it's been so good to have you. Thank you for your your leadership here, your expertise, uh, your career, you know, that you really devoted to uh, this relevant space and your your insights today. We're looking forward to to seeing what you do with Run AI, given all the momentum you have and how important this topic is. And it's clear as a, as a key partner of NVIDIA is that you guys uh, had some amazing, amazing insight. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Jeff. I had fun. Thanks. The Future of Podcast is brought to you by Fresh Consulting. To find out more about how we pair design and technology together to shape the future, visit us at freshconsulting.com. Make sure to search for The Future of an Apple podcast, Spotify, Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Make sure to click subscribe so you don't miss any of our future episodes. And on behalf of our team here at Fresh, thank you for listening.